morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's a joy to be gathered with you on this beautiful October morning in the midst of the return of Maple Leaf Festival, which uh, feels good to my heart. I don't know about yours, but it, it is good to see um, some little pieces of normal happening all around us. I uh, want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online and uh, celebrate that we have this way to worship together even when we're not together and um, just in, let you know that I've been praying for you and um, that Jeff let me know this morning about some of our statistics about the people who liked our Facebook page and what a fun way that is to be connected uh, to our community and to our world. A few reminders that I want to share with you. One is that it's hard to believe, but once again, this is the week when our deadline for getting things to Joy for the newsletter hits. So um, if you have, have things for her to include in the November newsletter, uh, make sure that you're getting those to her so that we can keep everyone near and far uh, up to date on what's happening in the life of our church. Another is that Tuesday at 1.30, the UMW will be gathering. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be meeting, I believe, here at the church. And uh, then I have one more, and it just left me. Don't remember what it was going to be. <laughs> well, if nobody else remembers, then it may not have been that big a deal. <laughs> 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 we will try to use uh, lots of means of communication. If, if it was something important and I think of it later, we will, we will get it to people. Uh, I think that's all the announcements that I have. Does anybody else have announcements to share? All right, then will you stand as you're able and join with me in a responsive call to worship? It may sound familiar for those of you who were here last week. Once we were no people. Now, now we, we are, are God's people. people. Once we had not received mercy. Now, now we, we have received, received God's, God's mercy. Let us remain standing as you're able and sing with joy our opening hymn, Faith of Our Fathers, number 710.
the Hebrews, comes from verses 32 through 39, after the author of Hebrews has gone through a whole litany of the heroes of the faith and their faithfulness, their righteousness, and the promises that God held for them. He goes on to say, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, they were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I initially was planning out the fall and conceived of this little mini-series to sort of squeeze between our six-week series on living in a strange land and doing something that has to do with gratitude and generosity in the month of November and then our Advent series in December. And I thought, how cool would it be for us to think about what it means to really stop and give thanks for the church of the past and the present and the future? It was only a few weeks ago when that sort of idea went from some notes jotted in my calendar to, okay, now it's time to actually plan the services, did it occur to me I now have a two-point charge. And this means that I have to be knowledgeable on the, the history of not one, but two congregations. And then I began to wonder about my own sanity a little bit. <laughs> and I got really excited. I knew that first had a little uh, notebook that was kind of a, a condensed uh, st uh, story of their history, and I had been given the Baker lands that told me about the history of Baldwin. And once you know the history of the town, it's much easier to plug in the church's particular history. I had no idea what kind of treasure trove I was going to find, though. When somebody told me that, that there was a, a, note, a notebook of history, actually there's two notebooks of history, because this notebook is only the first hundred years of your history, and it only goes till 2004 which at first I think seems rather recent, and then I remember that was the year I was engaged to be married to Ross and in college, and I realized it's been a while. <laughs> and so I admit to you all that I have only made it like maybe this far into your history because it's so fascinating. Here's the other thing. Uh, those of you who've had a chance to get to know me in the community may have already figured this out. Some of you are just now figuring it out. I'm a total nerd. I'm a total nerd. And there are a couple of things that get me like really, really nerding out. And one of them happens to be history. I love, and I not like big broad strokes history. I love the nitty gritty specifics. The kind of stuff that you have gathered here where you can read the actual clippings from the newspaper. And you know, think about things like, um, reading the, the obituary for Captain Ives and realizing that right next to it is a column that has all of the events for First Methodist whole week in the town newspaper because the two are intertwined to such an extent. And I have kind of a, a thing for figuring out why 
uh, smaller towns and communities end up with more than one United Methodist Church because it happens in a variety of ways. And I remember when I first moved here uh, several years ago that I was surprised to learn that Ives Chapel had not been an EUB church because in my history, most of the time when a smaller town has two United Methodist churches, it's because in 1968 they had had a Methodist Episcopal Church and an Evangelical United Brethren Church. And so then when they both became United Methodist, there ended up being two United Methodist churches in town. Uh, it happens that this is a fairly common scenario in my career because I'm part of a clergy couple. My husband is also a United Methodist pastor, and the best places to find jobs for the both of us tend to be places where there are lots of United Methodist churches to choose from. And so we've ended up in a couple of communities that had multiple churches and uh, different kinds of scenarios in, in one church where we were actually both working in the same church. Uh, we were working in the large church downtown in a place called Plainfield, Illinois. But you could actually see the tower of the church we worked at from the front yard of the other United Methodist Church in town, Rose of Sharon, UMC. And we often talked about what a strange sort of situation it was to be two separate church entities working in the same community so close to one another. It happened that one of our best friends from seminary was serving that church, and so we enjoyed very much being part of that cooperation. Many years later, Ross and I moved to a place called Marion, Kansas, and in Marion, Kansas, which was smaller than Baldwin, uh, there were two United Methodist churches, and we each served one of them. And, and what we noticed was that neither of them was First Methodist. And the interesting thing about that was they were one of those cases where in 1968 there had been a Methodist Episcopal Church and an EUB Church. And they had been at that time only about a block apart. Luckily, as, as it would happen, the, the EUB Church was in the process of building in a new space out by where the schools were going to go. And so they made an agreement between the two churches that they would each take a name specific to their geography in the town, and neither one would be First Methodist. And so we had Eastmore and Valley United Methodist churches. But your history is entirely different from that. What an interesting thing to find out. I had been trying to guess when this building was built uh, based on, again, did I tell you I'm a nerd? Um, having grown up as a preacher's kid, I've been around a lot of church buildings, and so there are patterns that arise when you're around church buildings of figuring out that in certain eras, church buildings had certain kinds of looks. You can figure out, uh, particularly that the churches often built in the like 30s and especially the 40s will tend to be big sort of square brick structures, and they're focused heavily on having lots and lots of Sunday school rooms because that was a time in the Methodist history when a great deal of the focus was on um, Christian education and the importance of the Sunday school programs, and so their buildings reflect that. Other churches uh, that look a lot like this one, that are sort of the white clapboard church that tend to be a sanctuary and a sort of multi-purpose space tacked onto it, sometimes all built at the same time, but often the sanctuary was built first, the multi-purpose room was added at a later time. Those are, are the ones that I, I tend to call them pioneer churches. They're the ones that often cropped up with the westward expansion uh, sometime around the late 1800s and early 1900s. What I didn't expect to find out was that this church had been Presbyterian before it was Methodist. This building, not the congregation. And that in his foresight and his understanding of the unique needs of folks on the west end of town, Captain Ives had purchased it and gone about church planting. Sometimes we talk about church planting as if it's this modern thing that we've only just discovered how to do. And then we remember that that's just not the case. Captain Ives had been a, an active and faithful member downtown 
somebody who was involved in the life of the whole town and community, and who had a knack for seeing into the future, for knowing what would be needed down the road. In town that showed up in his work on roads and, and highways, they probably weren't called highways yet, but in road work and making sure that there were reliable roads for people to travel on. But in his life of faith, he understood that there was a need for another place to gather, for an opportunity to plant faith out here on the west side of town, among folks who weren't part of the downtown crowd. And so I think about both our shared history between Ives and First, the Kibbe cabin, and the old stone church. But then I also think about the particular nature of those who are at the foundation of this congregation. Those who were looking ahead, thinking about what the community would need, about what would offer good news to others. And I think about how it is that we can continue to live that legacy. Because whenever we dig into the history and the story of our families, or our congregations, or our communities. The question we're really asking is, who are we? And who, how are we called to live? And we return to the letter to the Hebrews. And remember that as the author goes through this litany of the heroes of the faith and then, and then adds on this sort of speed reading of all the people he doesn't have time for. I love that. I don't have time for these folks, but here they are anyway. I presume you'll go figure it out who it was that shut the mouth of the lions or defeated the fury of the flames. As we look at all these people... We don't think about it as just something that happened in the past. Part of what the author is getting at is what will come in the following chapters of Hebrews. A call to live like those who came before us. To live lives of faithfulness. Lives connected to God. Lives centered and sure of who it is that is our cornerstone. We are called to be disciples, not of Captain Imes, not of Thomas Kibbe, not of John Wesley. We are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to live as those for whom Christ lived and died and was raised again, to remember that our history tells us something of who we have been. And it is Christ who tells us who we are called to be. And for this shared heritage, we give thanks to God. I would invite you to prepare your hearts for prayer as we sing together our prayer song, which is Seek Ye First, number 405 in the hymnal.
here to join together in prayer for our community. I want to raise a few um, things for you to know and, and to be praying about. We want to pray for the, the family of Wade Allen in his passing. We want to pray for Gary and for the Lee family. And then we want to celebrate with great thanksgiving the birth of Pastor Linda's newest grandson, Heath. Uh, received, uh, Gretchen and I both received pictures earlier this week uh, letting us know that he had arrived safely and Grandma has gotten to hold him. And so all is right with the world. So we give thanks for Heath's uh, safe arrival and that Mom is doing well as well. If you have other names that you would like to lift for prayer, you may raise them now or hold them silently in your hearts. Let us carry our hearts to God in prayer. Holy and merciful God, our hearts overflow with thanksgiving for the gift of new life in the birth of Heath, for the joy that comes with grandparenting. We pray for those who are sick and suffering, for those who are injured and hurting. And Lord, we lift up to you those whose hearts are heavy with sorrow and grief at the loss of a loved one. We give you thanks for the joy in our town over the return of the Maple Leaf Festival, and we pray your safekeeping on so many people who have gathered in our community. We continue to remember those who have taken on the difficult work of caretaking. For those who are caretakers, for a family member or a loved one, and those who have chosen this service as their vocation and their calling in you, O oh God. Grant your strength, your peace, your wisdom, and your tender care. Grant that all of us may remember who we are, both as part of this congregation and this community and as followers of Christ. And give us strength to pray boldly as children of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to take a moment to reflect on where it is that you have seen God's generosity and abundance in your life in the last week. And to consider how it is that God might be calling you to respond out of that same abundance with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. If part of that response is financial support for the life of this church, you can do that in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary or by mailing a check to us at 1018 Miami here in Baldwin City. Know that your gifts are appreciated and we will strive to treat them with the same, same attitude of generosity and abundance toward others. Now, with joy in your hearts, will you sing with me the doxology?
consider the anthem of Baldwin City, Great is Thy Faithfulness, a hymn written right here in our own town.